In our fifth video in the series on how to build a circuit on a physical breadboard based on a circuit diagram, we are going to introduce an H bridge, which is going to be controlled by a microcontroller, the Arduino Uno. So we have a handful of new symbols in the diagram here, and the H bridge comes as an integrated circuit in a dual inline package. If you're not familiar with that jargon, you might want to go back one video in this series where we introduced op amps, which also come in a similar package. You can find those videos linked in the description below this one. So as usual, if you have a circuit component where the connections are not obvious, so we have simple things like resistors where there's just two leads on the physical resistor and two corresponding wires on the circuit diagram, we have a whopping 16 pins on the H bridge here. And if you are using Tinkercad, which is this online circuit simulator, it does give you a nice little mouse over tool tip that tells you what each pin is but you don't have that when you're working with a physical circuit, so you need to go look up the data sheet, which will usually give you a nice diagram that labels all of the pins and tells you what they do. So this particular H-Bridge, the L293D, is designed for unidirectional control of four motors or bidirectional control of two motors. So for example, hand if you're building something like a robot with two motors, we're only going to be connecting one motor today, so we're going to be using about half the pins. Let's go through and figure out what they do. So I'm going to go a little out of order here. First, let's talk about these in the middle, heat sink and ground. So there are four heat sink and ground pins, and you notice that technically you only need one pin for electrical ground, but these are also serving as a heat sink, so this gives it more contact area with the underlying circuit board or breadboard to help dissipate more heat. Motors draw a lot of current, so you're gonna have a lot of current flowing through this chip, and you wanna be able to dissipate that safely. We also note that this chip has two different supply voltages labeled VCC1 and VCC2. VCC1 is the five volt logic voltage, and VCC2 can be anywhere from 4.5 up to 36 volts. That's the voltage source that is actually going to power your motors. So it's going to become very important when building the circuit on the breadboard later, Everything is going to need a common ground, but you have to make sure you do not short circuit this five volts to whatever your motor supply voltage is. Next, we have our inputs and outputs labeled A and Y respectively. So there are four of these. The inputs are controlled by your logic level voltage from your microcontroller. And when an input goes high, it sets the corresponding output high, but the outputs are connected to the motor power voltage. So that is what allows you to use a five volt voltage from something like an Arduino to switch a potentially higher voltage on and off to power a higher powered motor. And again, there are four of those, one, two, three, and four. Finally, there are the two enable pins, which can override the inputs to enable or disable an entire side. So in order for a motor output to be high, both the corresponding enable pin and the corresponding input must be high. If either one of those is low, then the output will be low. So that's an overview of the chip. And here is an example of what a circuit diagram could look like. You might be given this, or you might just be given the chip and asked to hook it up to the microcontroller yourself and have to select which pins you're going to use. Here I am showing that we are using five volts from the Arduino for that logic voltage. We're gonna use an external six volt battery pack for the motor. We only have a single motor connected. We're leaving the right hand side blank, although we could correct a sec connect a second motor there. And we're using three different pins on the Arduino, two for direction control, and a third is gonna be for speed control using a PWM signal. So let's switch over to the breadboard and show how we would hook all of this up. So first, let's get the integrated circuit in the breadboard. In general, when you're building a circuit, I recommend starting with the most complex component and then building your circuit and connecting other things around that. So we're gonna use this instead of say, connecting the motor first. I'm gonna put this straddling that gap in the middle of the breadboard. Remember that with a dual inline package, that means that the two sides are isolated from each other. You do not want to put the entire chip on one side of the breadboard because all of the holes in this row are connected and you are then shorting those pins together. You also wanna look for the notch or the dot which indicates the top of the chip. The pins are numbered counterclockwise starting in the top left. So while you can technically turn this upside down and build a circuit that still works, you have to be very careful because the way you have it oriented does not match what is shown in the data sheet. So I'm gonna flip this right side up again there and then we're gonna go ahead and just systematically make all of the connections based on the diagram. 
So as usual, there's no right or wrong way to do this. You could say you want to go in numerical order or you could kind of pick categories like ground and power and then these signals. So I'm gonna take that approach and start with the ground wires because I think they're kind of simple to get out of the way. So those are gonna be pins four, five, 12, and 13. So pin four, I'm just gonna run ground wires over to all my ground buses. Again, I get that nice tooltip in Tinkercad that reminds me which pin I have, but in real life, you're not gonna have that. So I'm going to connect all my ground pins to the ground buses, then zoom out a bit. Remember, I want a common ground for my whole circuit. The buses on opposite sides of the breadboard are not connected, so I want to make sure I am adding a ground wire, connecting those, so I have a common ground for everything. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and set up my power supply voltages. And again, this is very important, probably the biggest mistake I see students make when working with an H-bridge. Many times when using a breadboard, you're just working with a single supply voltage, and as a result, you will connect the power buses on opposite sides so you have that same voltage available everywhere. You do not want to do that when working with an H-bridge like this because if I run this power two pin over to that bus and this power one pin over to this bus, those are gonna be shorted together and ultimately I need these to be two different voltages. I'm gonna have five volts from my Arduino and six volts from my battery pack. So in this case, make sure you do not have a wire connecting those two opposite side buses. Now. You don't have to wire it like this. For example, you could leave those buses connected if say for some reason I do want my Arduino, say you're building something with other sensors with the Arduino and you want five volts easily accessible everywhere, then you certainly could do that and say ultimately run this over to five volts from your Arduino later and then have the six volt line from your battery pack go directly to this pin if that's gonna be the only place you'll use it. That is also perfectly valid. No matter what you do, just be very careful that you do not short those two pins together. So I'm gonna take this approach and I'm going to use one bus for each voltage. But as usual, I'm gonna wait until the very end to connect the battery pack and turn my voltage on. In general, you don't wanna be building a circuit with live power. With battery power, you're not really gonna electrocute yourself, but you could damage components on the circuit if you have a short circuit. So next, let's add the Arduino, which I have set up next to the breadboard here. Usually I like to have these both oriented in portrait mode, so all of the writing is in the same orientation, but depending on your project and the way you have things physically arranged, that may not be the case. You may have longer wires running from the Arduino to the breadboard, but it's just kind of convenient to have things right next to each other here. And note that the diagram does not show the entire Arduino. This is a pretty simple one that's only using three pins on the Arduino, so it's kind of a waste to draw the entire thing with all of these other unused pins. We're just using pins two, three, and four, and sometimes you'll see this sort of flag symbol to represent a microcontroller pin. However, be careful because notice that these are out of order. So in the Arduino, the digital pins go in order from zero up to 13 at the top. And here I go two, four, three, just because that kind of lined up with the order that they're connected on the H bridge. And also be careful that the Arduino pin numbers do not necessarily match up to the H bridge pin numbers. So just be careful with the physical order things, order of things and the pin numbers when you're doing this and not to get those mixed up. So here I'm just gonna work from top to bottom on the H bridge. I have Arduino pin three connected to H bridge pin one. So I'm gonna run a wire over there and you are kinda can choose what makes sense to you for color coding here. Again, red and black are usually used for power and ground. For signals, it's kind of more of a choice for what's consistent for you and it's gonna make debugging easy. So say I'm gonna use green for signal wires from my Arduino for controlling this motor. So Arduino pin four is going to go to H bridge pin two. It's another wire here. Again, I'm trying to keep my wiring neat in Tinkercad. You wanna do the same thing with a physical circuit. When you start getting a lot of crisscrossed wires, it can make it harder to debug and again, Color coding can make things easier to trace. Finally, Arduino pin two is gonna go over to H bridge pin seven. So that is pin seven here, input two. So there, I've made my three connections to the Arduino. Now note that something that is implied in this diagram, but not shown, your entire circuit needs a common ground and that includes the Arduino. So when you see the microcontroller pins like this, it is assumed that your microcontroller also shares a ground with the rest of the circuit, even though, again, the entire Arduino is not shown. I did not explicitly show the Arduino ground pin connected to ground, so make sure you go ahead and add a ground wire as well. 
Then final connection to the Arduino. Again, I didn't show this with the pin symbol. I just showed a five volt label, but I know that that five volts in this case is going to come from the Arduino. And remember which bus I'm running that to. I am running that over here to pin 16. So I'm gonna need one really long wire. And again, in Tinkercad, it's kind of a good idea to route this around instead of going in a straight line like this because this gets messy. When you're working with a physical circuit, if you have long wires as well, you might want to use cable ties or something to make sure you get some strain relief and you aren't yanking on those wires or disconnecting things or getting them tangled. But here I'm going to run my 5 volt wire up and around so it's not blocking things on my breadboard. So there I go. All my connections to my Arduino. Again, only three of which are explicitly shown with this pin symbol. The ground connection is implied and then 5 volts is coming from the 5 volt supply on my Arduino. So checking off my connections, again, I decided to go out of order here. So I have my ground connections, I have my Arduino connections, I have my five volts. I still need to connect the motor and the six volt battery pack. So we're gonna zoom out a little here to make some more space. Here is a DC motor in Tinkercad. Now you might ask, okay, well, how do I know whether to connect the positive or negative side of the motor to which one of these pins that isn't labeled there? For a regular DC motor, reversing the wires is just going to reverse the direction the motor spins, or which way is clockwise or counterclockwise. And in this case, since we're connecting it to an Arduino, we can also control that with software. So it's kind of arbitrary which way you connect it. Maybe if you're building a robot and it makes more intuitive sense for one way to be forward in your code based on your variables, um, you can do that. But I am just gonna make it line up nicely with the orientation of the motor here. And again, looking at connection, my connections on the circuit diagram, I'm using pins three and six on the H bridge. So there we go. There are my connections to the motor, which I've decided to put off to the side here instead of cramming in between the Arduino and the breadboard. And then the last thing I need is my external battery pack for that six volts. So I'm gonna switch this to four batteries. And again, remember that, let's get this rotated. I need a common ground for everything. So I need to connect my battery pack negative lead to the ground for the entire circuit, but I am only gonna run the positive lead over to the left side power bus, which I am using for six volts. You see that is connected to the lower left pin or pin eight of the H bridge, and that's six volts on my diagram. So be careful, you do not want to wind up shorting this power pin from the battery pack to the five volts from the Arduino because those are two different voltages that creates a short circuit directly between six volts and five volts. Lots of current flows and bad things happen, so don't do that. So programming the Arduino is a topic for another series of videos, but in this case, I have written some really simple code that just um, is going to turn the motor on and spin it in one direction continuously. So if I hit start simulation, I see that I have wired everything correctly and my code is working and this motor is just going to turn on and spin one way. That is it for this video. Again, I think students tend to get a little intimidated by the H bridge at first just because of its size and the number of connections. But if you carefully look at the data sheet and step through the connections pin by pin, so you build a whole circuit systematically, then you can handle it. Just look out for those common mistakes. Again, the most common one I see is shorting together the two different operating voltages in the circuit. Other things like just double checking your breadboard rows, making sure your connections aren't off by one row, or something like having the integrated circuit upside down so all of the pins are reversed. Look out for those mistakes and you should be able to figure everything out. Now remember that you can find prior videos in this series linked in the description below this one. And in the next video, we are going to look at debugging circuits when things don't work.